Okay, this is the optional lecture four video, along with some comments about minor writing assignment two that we're covering in class. So nothing in this lecture is necessary for the course. And this is really just strengthening some of the phonological skills that we've learned in the past week. And to put an emphasis on the fact that biology is a pretty important part of phonetics. So to start with the writing two general comments, uh, this was another one that was very well executed. There were some cases of storytelling, so things like first, then, finally, and this can be rearranged. So rather than it being like actions you took, you can use these prepositional phrases, things like by comparing and then talking about two words that you compare. By comparing X and Y, you found minimal pairs, or by analyzing or you could even say things like looking at, uh, looking at X and Y. So instead of telling it as if it's a story, you can tell it more like you're there in the moment with them, and telling them what to do, if that makes a little bit more sense. So you wanna take the writing away from your experience with the data set and instead put it just on the data. Uh, there is also a little bit of over explanation of the data set so if you're doing the same thing multiple times you just really have to describe how you're doing it once show an example and then basically point out that you're using the same method to discover everything else so really in this you had uh, minimal pairs so you could just really describe one minimal pair and how you found it and then apply that to everything else and then there's the process of elimination. So you probably did one or both of those. I think you had to do both of those. And then that's two fully explained examples. And then the rest can be just noted that you've used that method to determine the rest of the morphemes. So the other morphemes can be found by using the same methodology. And then you could list those morphemes or not. The last part was this uh, verb template. So it should be root pronoun, root agreement. Uh, root pronoun is really a better way to put it. And I was expecting most people to put it at the end, but some people incorporated it right away and tied it to data. So instead of just saying like a statement, like this language uses a root pronoun template, they actually gave specific examples from the data and tied it in, which I thought was very nice. So that was something I didn't expect that came out very well for a few papers. So obviously, if you just put the one sentence at the end, that's not really a big problem um, because that's what I was expecting. But it is nice to see uh, that the instructions for the data, for the data set and the, the writing itself, uh, you took those instructions and you, you melded them together to create something very cohesive, which was nice. So here's a couple highlights of different data sets. So I just uh, picked ones that were different from each other. So we have some examples. What I like about the one on the top left is that the morpheme is like isolated. So you can tell exactly what you are looking at. And there's some bolding that corresponds to the morpheme. Makes it really easy to read. Uh, another one at the bottom was very similar. One ABCD, taking a look at all of the minimal pair contrast, which was nice. Uh, this example in the middle, what it does is it takes all the roots and puts them with numbered examples. Typically, this would be done with a table and not numbered examples. Um, but to start, that's fine. And this last one is done in LaTeX, which obviously looks a little bit different, a little bit more professional. Here's an example of a table of all of the morphemes found. Now, in this paper, there were two sets of morphemes, one for the process of elimination method, one for the minimal pair method. So I think that this table could use a better description, something more precise, like when morphemes determined by minimal pairs. But overall, it's a nice table, and it's quite easy to see what's being pointed out there. So those are all nice examples. There were other ones as well, but I wanted to pick four that looked uh, different from each other and say that it doesn't really matter which method you use as long as it follows the standard conventions, which is, you know, related examples are put with letters, everything's numbered, sometimes they're in tables, um, and you find something that you like. So use the method that you enjoy, that you think makes your writing the clearest that it can be. Here are some highlights of explanations. 
So I won't really talk too much about this. I like the first one a lot because it's just very clear. Uh, that's really all there is to say about it. It's very clear. So what they're trying to say is being said. And in the second one, I like this comparison of examples uh, because it's two minimal pairs that um, really you need to use the process of elimination for kind of well, you would have determined that Gwaif was a morpheme at some point from Gwaif Am. And you're comparing Am and Amas. So what I like about this is that in the writing, it, it poses the problem. It says it's not readily apparent where the root morpheme ends and the suffix begins using this method. So it points out the problem and then it gives a reason as to what, or gives an explanation as to what has to be done. So they say, therefore, it's necessary to compare 1A and 1B. They're directly referencing the examples, which is great, uh, to a second verb with two different subjects. So they, they explain what the problem is and what they have to do, which is nice. Uh, in this one, I thought I'd also add in some, some learning together. So I can take some sentences that point out specific things, uh, look at them. I can rewrite them into something that's proper notation and then make some comments about them. So the first one, uh, this was a great tie-in with the verb template and the data. I thought this was done well. Uh, the only thing to improve here would be consistency. So we don't really need these uh, brackets around root pronoun. Then we have some morphemes ta ursh and then the morpheme mari. So uh, in this case, the morphemes Ha, Ursh, and Mari are all morphemes. So the convention for them should be similar. So I rewrote it with dashes and italiz italiz italicization, um, but this could be done with quotation marks as well, just to make sure that uh, everything is consistent. Also, instead of the brackets, I would have put uh, commas here instead. Or actually, this one doesn't need commas because you're talking about um, two specific pronouns. The second one is another good one. Uh, it talks exactly about what they're doing. There is some storytelling here, but uh, the examples are pointed out. So uh, 1.2.3 .2 and 8, these could be formatted again with the notation with parentheses because you're pointing out examples. Um, with the morpheme U here, it would be a little bit better to put the actual Wenja morpheme in this case. So uh, that way, you know, you're analyzing that data set. You're not analyzing English, you're, ana you're analyzing a, a constructed language, so you should talk in terms of that language rather than English. Um, so this was a nice reference to examples. Uh, another thing is that this example number eight could have been reordered to number four, that way you could have used something like examples one through four, uh, just to put relevant examples together. You don't need to keep everything the same as what I give you in the data set. You can reorder things as, as you'd like to suit your writing. So this lecture, this optional lecture is on constructed languages and phonology. So it's not meant to be anything new, anything you're going to analyze yourself. We're not analyzing languages of animals or anything like that. Uh, this is just to show some biology off, I'll show how sounds are connected to that, and then show some interesting constructed languages that we can use to strengthen our analog uh, analysis skills. So this is a cool website, vulgarlang.com. You can input sounds, so vowels and consonants, and it will make a constructed language for you. It'll give you 200 words. It does phonology, it does phonetics, it does morphology and syntax. It's quite incredible. and. I used it to create one of the constructed languages in this lecture set. So you can see here, it gives you the phonemic inventory. It gives you a syllable structure and stress pattern. So this is very nice. It shows you which ones are optional. So the V, the vowel is required, but you can have up to one consonant in the onset and three consonants in the coda. It shows you how to make plural nouns, for example, and then gives you a list of words with their spelling and their pronunciation. So I thought that was quite cool. So we'll start with human conlangs, and we're really just gonna show one of them off, which is Navi from Avatar. So it's not really, I, I put human in quotes because it's more like humanoid. These are conlangs that assume 
uh, some sort of human-like biology. So this is the mid-sagittal of the human head. You've probably seen this with white lines before and uh, no filling, but this is a, a colored version of it. So as you can see, you have your lips here with the humans, you have your teeth, you have your alveolar ridge right here. It's quite hard. It's a harsher color here. Uh, we start going into the post-alveolar region over here. We have our palate at the top. And then back here, we have our velar region. And then we have our uvular region. If we look down here, we have this thing called the epiglottis. Uh, what this thing does is it catches food, so it doesn't go down your, uh, it doesn't go into your lungs. Um, you'll see it contrasted with chimps a little bit later. And we don't quite see it here, but in this area is the glottal region, so this is where your vocal folds are. We can also see a nice passage into the nasal cavity here. So you can actually see that your oral and nasal cavity are connected, which I've learned is not common knowledge. Um, Actually, story for myself, I didn't even know that the nasal and oral cavities were connected until I was like in my late teens when I had some sort of a nose problem and mucus problem. I won't go into the details there, but yeah, like how, how, why does your nose mucus drip into your throat? Well, it's because they're connected, dummy. Like <laughs> that was me like 12 years ago, so I don't blame people. So, uh, Sounds for these human conlangs are, are understood by this you know, mid-sagittal. All the parts of the mouth that we have, the fact that our tongue is quite flexible. You can see here this cavity it gives us essentially a lot of room to move our tongue around. So, uh, Navi is from Avatar. Not the airbenders, but the person in the top right. Uh, so this one is heavily inspired by human languages. And there's, there's not much uniqueness here. It's very well grounded in human language. So there are some sounds that we haven't discussed yet. So these are called ejectives. So these use the little apostrophe after a stop. And basically there's a burst of air from your glottis when you pronounce it. I can't really do it, but uh, <laughs> that's not quite it. Um, but there, there's a very loud... Um, sound that comes from the glottis when they're pronounced. So uh, in this language, this has this pattern of something called lenition. So uh, what we'll see in these words are two morphemes coming together to create this compound. Well, not really a compound. This is just an affix word, so a complex word. So uh, you have morphemes that I believe these act more like pronouns, or maybe they're a class or something. I can't quite remember which ones they are, but they're one of those two. And then you have a verb morpheme. So Lenition says that when two morphemes come together, there's a change in one of them. So if we take a look at this change, in the first example, we have uh, a to te becoming a sute. So this is a T becoming an S. So I'm just going to write this down on the side so we can see exactly what we're looking at. Uh, me poti becomes me foti, so that P becomes an F. Uh, we have some sounds with adjectives here. So when we have an adjective K, it just reduces to a normal K. So adjective K to regular K. In me kelku, we have me hilku. So that K is becoming an H. Just make a little chain there. And with the case of two ejective P's, that ejective P becomes a regular P. So we can add this to the chain as well. So we can make a prediction, really. And we can say that this ejective T will become a regular T, sort of like this chain of weakening. So you have these really strong ejective stops weakening to just regular stops, which weaken to fricatives. And they happen in the same place. So this is the alveolar case. Um, P to F. Uh, well, let's keep this in the labial case. Let's be general. And the K to H, I'm assuming this doesn't have velar fricatives or uvular fricatives. So it becomes a glottal H in this case. So velar to glottal, they're, they're very close in places of articulation. But we can see this ejective stop to stop to fricative pattern happening here, which is something that does happen in natural language. 
So if you extend this and you're given a new words, uh, adjective P plus adjective T, well, we expect the first adjective to stay the same, but this second adjective is going to weaken to a regular T and we'll get uh, a talk. Couldn't pronounce the P, I cannot do adjectives. It's something that requires a lot of practice and uh, you don't really have them in a lot of these Western Indo-European or Germanic languages like English is so. Uh, yeah, difficult to pronounce. But that's something that happens in Navi, that happens in real life as well. So, lenition is the broad term. This is something that happens when there's a morphological change. Uh, there are different specific terms for these actual processes, um, but a lot of them are things that you would look up when you're trying to analyze a problem or you're working in that area. So, let's... Uh, Get into the non-human ones. These are a little bit more interesting because a lot of these are based on non-human anatomy. So some people will create languages that are uh, very realistic. So they look at the anatomy, they look at what's capable of the, of the actual animal, and they create a language that fits that. Uh, others sort of ignore the anatomy and just create whatever they want. So if we compare something like the chimp head and the human head, what we see with the chimp and the human is that there's not really that much of a difference. Um, chimp heads are definitely flatter. The inside of the mouth is flatter as well. Uh, they don't have as much control over their tongue as humans do in terms of uh, uh, speech production. But one of the major differences here is the epiglottis. So human epiglottises are way further down than the chimp epiglottis. Uh, basically. Um, we allow food to go into this chamber and it catches it a little bit later. While it chimps, it'll actually store food in the back and then the epiglottis opens up and it basically completely closes off the, uh, your, your air cavity or your trachea and it, it sends food into the esophagus. So that's one difference. It doesn't have a, a big impact on con langs when you're making... A, when you're making the phonemic inventories for them, uh, but it is something to point out that's biologically different. So what's interesting about chimps is that theoretically, they can produce all of the sounds that humans can, as long as they were to have more muscular control and actually have the cognitive ability to produce speech sounds and have language. So they could produce language. In fact, actually what's interesting is that macaques have been shown to be able to produce all of the vowels in uh, human languages. So in English, we have like, what is it, like 12 to 17, depending on the dialect. But of the 30 plus vowels, I believe there's at least 30, uh, macaques can make all of them. So yeah, why can't they produce speech? It's really about muscular control, and it's really about cognitive factors. So there's a physical aspect, and there's an, a cognitive aspect to it, too. Link 100 goes into a lot more detail about this, so if you want to learn about that, you can take that course. It's a very broad course about linguistics, and the first couple of weeks are usually on animals and why they don't have language. So, if macaques could produce sounds, would there be any sounds in English that they couldn't do? And it would be hard to give definite answers to this. But the understanding is that theoretically they could produce any English sound. Um, they have teeth so they can do interdentals. Um, what they might not be able to do, and I would have to do more research into actual uh, chimp biology, it's whether they have control over the back of their tongue to bunch it up. So it is possible that these retroflex sounds, so if we compare a regular R to the retroflex R, it's possible that retroflexes wouldn't be possible if they don't have control over the back of their tongue to bunch it up. So that would be uh, the R, the T, and the D there. And those are all the curled ones. So like in the word Trevor, when I pronounce it. Um, but I can't say that for certain. So theoretically, they could produce anything. So here's a conlang made with vulgarlang.com. And... It just uses the sounds that would be um, easy for chimps to make, 
given the muscular control that they have. So things like the bilabial sounds with their lips and a glottal H, so just pushing air out. We also know that macaques can produce every vowel that humans can. So uh, there's 6, 12, 16, 18, 20, 24, 28, 29 vowels here that are possible. It was very close. So this was made using vulgarlang.com. I just put in these vowels, sorry, these consonants, and I put in all these vowels, and we'll see what it produced. So I just chose some words from it uh, to do some problem sets. So let's determine if u, sorry, u, and u are separate phonemes, or if they're allophones of the same phoneme. So uh, first we look for minimal pairs. We're not going to find any minimal pairs. The language should not produce any at all. So we can see exactly what we have here with environment charts. And hopefully we'll find some evidence for uh, having allophones or something. So ua happens after a p at the end of a word. It ha so in sudden, in seed, it happens in the same environment. In seat, it happens at the beginning of a word before an h. And that is it. In the second one, in uh, runner, and I'll just put it to the left a little bit here. In runner, it happens after a B at the end of a word. In seed, it happens between an M and a P. In pillow, it happens between a P e and a B. In there, it happens between an M and a B. In bite, it happens between a B and an H. And in only, it happens at the beginning of a word before a B. So if we take a look at the environments here, there might not be anything at first glance that looks important. Um, but what I do notice, and I think it's just from the examples I chose uh, where this happens, um, but I can actually find something. So if you were to say these have similar environments and not see anything, I would understand. But what I see here is that in the U cases, there are no voice sounds surrounding it. While in the U case, there's a B, M, B, 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 B. So in each case, there's some voiced sound surrounding it. So uh, for U, we could say... Uh, between, or um, we could put a really constraint around it instead of like a, a rule for it. Uh, we could say no surrounding voiced sound, and we could say u is elsewhere. So this is a process that you wouldn't really see in natural language often, if at all. Um, this is something that would be very conlang specific because it's really searching for one particular sound in both of its surrounding environments. And typically that's uh, either it's you take a look at both of the environments. So if you have like X and Y, it's either X and Y are both important or neither of them are important. Or if it's a specific sound like Y, it's usually because there's some property that's being shared or some property that is like, they're trying to be different. Um, or it would be something like a syllable boundary. But that's not really what we're seeing here. We're seeing something rather unique. So to say that there's no pattern here in terms of natural language, it makes sense. But in terms of uh, opening up our minds and trying some really weird things, we can find an explanation here. That's one for hoo-ha. Here's a second one for hoo-ha. This is uh, eh. And the rounded e, so u, sounds more like an u to some people, but this is just a rounded e. So you can just make an e sound, round your lips, and you get u. So um, let's take a look at this. Let's make an environment chart. I don't think there are minimal pairs here, so we'll just start straight with this. So for e and humor, it happens after a P at the end of a word. In protection, it happens between a... Oh, sorry. Should be looking at is. At situation, P at the end of a word. Uh, 
in chase, it happens at the beginning of a word before an H, and in according to, beginning of a word before a B. Now let's take a look at the rounded U. So in green, it happens between M and P. Same thing in humor. In protection, it's between B and M. In rifle, be between B and M as well. In aim, it's between B and B. And that's it. So, do we have allophones here? Well, I don't see any overlapping environments. Um, but what I do see for U is that it's between uh, voiced... What sounds? Between voice... No, not even between voiced bilabials. It's just between bilabials. And then in the I case, uh, that would be our elsewhere, since it's not between any bilabials. So we can claim that there is some allophony here. There's no repeated meanings. They have different environments. And these are closely related sounds, so the only difference is rounding. It says, is there a biological explanation for a pattern like this? This is just a thought question. I mean, we're talking about chimps here. So, you know, how would we know? It would have to be something to do with the lips, right? Um, it could be, but here's just thinking. We're just thinking here. Uh, what could be something possible? And we can think about humans too. Uh, if chimps produce a bilabial sound, we don't know if there's rounding or not. So maybe it could be the fact that bilabial sounds are produced with lip rounding in this uh, with chimps. That could be the case. Uh, it's not certain, but that would explain why the vowel itself does have rounding if they're trying to maintain rounding that whole time. Um, but the real answer is, you know, I don't know. We don't know. We can only speculate. If we were to study chimp biology more and see how they produce bilabial sounds, then maybe we could get some further insight. But again, it's perfectly okay in linguistics and any science to admit when you don't know something and to speculate. You can speculate, then you do some research, and until you can get yourself an actual research-backed hypothesis, your answer should be, I don't know, but I can speculate and I can look into things. So uh, never feel ashamed of not knowing something. That's the point of research. It's to figure things out. So we'll shift on to bird heads now. And here is a bird head. This is an interesting diagram because it's, um, this is the bottom of the bird beak. And this is the top of the bird beak. But it's like being peeled to the side. So yeah, it's not the clearest diagram. But if we take a look at it, if we take a look at the bottom, uh, we do see, so the palatine ridge, the lateral palatine ridge, median palatine ridge. Um, I don't really know what these are for. Uh, we do see something that's tongue-like in this area. So this would be the bottom here. And then we have some pharyngeal papillae. So some notion of a pharynx here. If we take a look at the top, we can actually see the glottis. In fact, I might have these backwards. Oh, I have this totally backwards here. This is my bet. I confuse myself with bottom and top. No, this this is the top. This is the bottom. I wonder I didn't understand what I was looking at. So the bottom, you have the tongue, you have the body of the tongue, you have the root of the tongue, you have the glottis itself. So we have a lot of things that are in uh, you know, humans as well. And what we have on the top here are some different ridges. So there's no alveolar ridge here, but we have the palatine ridge, lateral palatine ridge, median palatine ridge. Um, we have this area here that is unique to birds, and the esophagus is down further. So if we were to think about the sounds that they can make, we're not going to get like an alveolar sound, but we'll get something you know similar to it, a similar ridge-like sound, but we wouldn't get an alveolar ridge. Uh, we don't really get anything like a uvular or velar sound because that doesn't really exist in the bird biology. And we're not going to get a bilabial sound because bird beaks are hard. You, know, you can't um, make these soft sounds like b and p with a really hard beak. So 
Uh, this next language is taken very literally in the fact that birds cannot really have much control over their tongue or produce these sounds. Um, so this conlang called rousal uh, uses one sound for its language. It uses the vowel ah, and that's not enough phonemes to, phonemes to create words. So what they do is they apply tone, phonation, and length to the vowel to produce different sounds. So there is a very high tone, there's a high tone, a low tone, and a very low tone. So uh, we have four different tones for that vowel. There's phonation. So there's a, um, a breathy sound. So sort of like, uh, uh, there's a creaky sound. Uh, a creaky, you can kind of think of it a little bit like vocal fry in a sense, like ah, uh, ah. Uh. Uh, like, uh, I don't really know how well it's being <laughs> gotten to the microphone. And then modal, which would just be a regular sound. And there's a length contrast as well, so short versus long. So with that, uh, we get a total of well, way more morpheme, or way more phonemes because you can combine them. You can have a, a breathy, very high, long vowel. So what we get is four times three times two, so we get 24 different phonemes in the end. So here's an example of a sentence, or I guess multiple sentences, in Rousel. Uh, I will not attempt to pronounce it, but this would be a way that you could transcribe that speech. So, what can we possibly learn from something like this? Well, we can dig into tones and length, and we can see some processes in human languages that are very similar. So this, this what we're looking at here is something that would actually happen in a real language. So what's happening here? To be useless, we have this long vowel at the end, and that length is being shortened. To know, long vowel at the end, it's being shortened. To cling and to exist, again, two cases of long vowels that are being shortened. So this is just vowel shortening. And in this case, uh, vowels at the ends of words are becoming shorter. That's what happens here. And this happens in human languages as well. The reverse happens um, in some cases as well, where you have shorter vowels that become longer at the ends of words. Again, it, it really is language dependent. There's reasons that both of them could happen. But in this case, we see vowel shortening. For number two, here is a case where you have two similar tones back to back. So in this case, we have two vowels that have the same tone back to back. And you can think of these as like two single beats. If you think of music, like two quarter notes or something. So what you expect in the, in the output is like one plus one equals two. So two beats, so a half note. But what you see instead is that instead only the vowel is lengthened so you get this like one and a half beat instead. It's not twice as long, it's just a, a little bit longer than the standard vowel. So there is some shortening here because you're going from two beats to one and a half and in transcription, you're taking two separate vowels and just combining them to make one longer vowel. So we see that here as well in the second word and we see that in the third word as well. So when you have two vowels that are exactly the same, Instead of producing two of them at full length, you just produce one at a longer length. So another case of shortening. So those are two things that we would find in human languages as well. And we saw this earlier in the course with a word like in uh, numerous. So in numerous, instead of having two ends back to back, what happens is you get one end that is slightly lengthened in numerous, not in numerous. So if you take a look at that language and you think about Rosal, uh, you might have questions and we can speculate about some things and some speculations are uh, pretty straightforward and almost pointless, but you know, it's good to think about. So would it be possible for birds looking at Rosal to have any sort of consonant assimilation? Well, no, there's no consonants in the language. So we wouldn't expect to see any consonant assimilation. It's a stupid question, but it's one of these questions that might trip you up at times. 
Like you ask, well, how does that apply? This language doesn't have that thing. Well, if it doesn't have that thing, it can't do the process. So we don't have to ask ourselves, well, what if they had consonants? That's not what the question's asking. It's just in Rousel, do they have assimilation for consonants? No. Here's another question. Could it be possible for birds, as seen in Rousel, to change the height or depth of their vowels? So uh, in terms of the vowel chart, uh, if ah uh, is right about here, could we have cases where it moves backwards or could we have cases where it moves upwards? And this depends completely on the control of the tongue. And if we take a look at the assumptions for the language, that birds don't use speech articulators in real life, meaning that they don't use their tongue for speech, uh, the answer would be no. Um, but it's not unreasonable to think that maybe the tongue could move a little bit. So the answer I'd give is no, but maybe? Maybe they can move the ah a little bit upwards and get ah as an allophone? Who knows? Or I guess I wouldn't say ah and ah specifically, but sounds like that. So maybe, but likely no, unless they can actually prove that there's some uh, actual control over that tongue. So now we'll move into the last constructed language here, which is parcel tongue. So this is from Harry Potter, and what's interesting about this language is that in the Harry Potter universe, it is a language um, from snakes. So snakes are the ones that speak the language, but there are humans that can pronounce the language as well. So you have the people who can speak parcel tongue. So if, I, if my memory recalls from the Wikipedia, uh, Professor Snape could do it, Dumbledore could do it, the main character, Harry Potter, can probably do it because plot armor and everything has to work out conveniently for him. So, uh, yeah, this is a language that can be pronounced both by humans and snakes, theoretically. So what's interesting about parcel tongue is that all sounds are voiceless. There's no vibrations. Uh, there's an interesting new type of sound here. So sounds can be regular and breathy, but they can also be biting sounds. So... I don't know what these would sound like. Uh, you'd have to find a clip of Harry Potter online uh, with parse the tongue in it. But with biting, um, yeah, the sound is produced as a bite. So that's interesting, and it really relies on snake biology to do that. And you think about a traditional snake, you think, oh, it bites people. So they produce biting sounds. And uh, snakes can't round their lips, so all the sounds are unrounded as well. So here's a little chart and what you'll see on the left is some sounds, MF, NSEL, NSR, uh, NSHU, NK, and GUNH. And you'll notice that there are stop versions next to them. And the idea here is that in this language, and I'll just, we'll just show you the data set, there are words, specifically verbs, that start with a stop where it's under specified for place. What this means is that there is no specific place for stop. So, okay, so should be a B, sorry. I have all of these. Um, this seems to be an older version of the slide here. I'm not sure why, um, but what we can say here is, let's say we have the verb jump. We can say that there's a consonant at the beginning of the word jump, but we don't know what place it is. So jump on its own would not be grammatical. Instead, it has to be combined with other words. So let's say you have one jumps. What you get is chic. And because you have a K here, the stop, the underspecified stop at the beginning of the, of the verb, uh, the kinshe in this point in this point is going to get its place from the previous sound. So that's the velar sound, so the stop becomes velar and we get shi kinshe. With human jumps, we see shim, and then we have a shim, and then we have another inshe with an unspecified consonant. But because this is a M sound, uh, the language chooses the voiceless stop in the same place, the bilabial stop, so it becomes shim pinshe. And for the case of book jumps, you get 
part or pard, which is the initial analysis, we get part tinche. It says it's voiceless, but then in the references I had, um, it did have voiced sounds. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Either the wiki's wrong or the reference is wrong, <laughs> one of the two. Um, but the point is, regardless of how the actual words come out, uh, this is a process that happens in natural language as well. So this is called stop harmony. And there are a lot of cases where you have unspecified sounds. Uh, so you might have a language where, just like in this case, you might have a noun where we'll, we'll use D for unspecified stop. So we don't know which stop it is, but it doesn't have a place until it gets another sound before, in which case it changes it and says, oh, that shouldn't be an unspecified stop. It's going to take the same place as an M and it'll get a B. You'll see this with fricatives, um, not really with vowels too much, but normally with stops and fricatives, this is where it occurs. So in which case it wouldn't be stop harmony if you're looking at fricatives, but stop harmony is also a common process in languages. So if you were to outline writing on a constructed language, this is different than any task you'll do, but I'll talk through it. Uh, you would be introducing something totally new. So if you're gonna do a language on snake anatomy, you definitely have to, of course, introduce the language. You have to talk about that. You should probably bring up some snake anatomy so that way you can talk about what sounds are possible. So from the anatomy, you'd go into the phonemic inventory. And then following that, uh, you could continue with any sort of processes uh, showing examples. And then, of course, you can conclude it from there. But if you're going to do any sort of analysis on a different language uh, or something that people are very unfamiliar with, typically you want to introduce enough background information so that way people know the nuances and specialties of that language, of that thing you're observing. So, again, we're not really doing anything of this. So... Uh, in this video, I'll talk about major assignment one. In class, I'll do this on Wednesday. But in this case, you'll be analyzing a complex data set. So what I mean by this is that there's four mini data sets that need to be chained together. So whenever you write about something, typically you're not just looking at one phonological process. Typically, there's multiple things involved. And when you have multiple processes, you have to be able to organize it and explain it in a way that readers understand, which can be very difficult because you have to figure out what are the simpler things? What are the more complicated things? Uh, what leads into what? So this is like the capstone project of all the theor theoretical analyses we've done so far. So explaining a concept, you'll have to be able to explain, of course, what the processes are here, and then morphological and phonological analyses with rule orderings. We'll see that as well. So you have four data sets here. And they're not given in any order of explanation. So there's some morpheme stuff, there's a phonology thing, and it's going to be your job to write about them in the order that makes sense. So do not follow the order I've given you here. The order I've given you here is truly not the best way to do this. Um, why? Because there's a phonology thing right in the middle that breaks up the whole discussion of morphemes. So it's your job to figure out how to do it. For each mini data set, I've given you an actual task and a way to figure it out. So the actual analysis here should not be too difficult. Um, it's more so writing and organizing that'll be more difficult. So the first one has you identify present and this should say future morphemes, past morphemes. Sorry, this was taken from an older version. Again, this is an older lecture slide. I don't know why. I just did the new one. Um, the second one has you take a look at the affix that converts verbs into nouns. So you have a base verb form, and then you're determining what turns it into a noun. In set three, you have two phonological processes. I've given you some words, and you're supposed to determine the rule order for how they're applied. So pretty similar to the one you saw for the third one um, and the ones in class. So there's one where we're inserting a sound, so similar to the one in class. Actually, they're both similar to the ones in class. What am I talking about? We have vowel insertion between two voice consonants, and then we have word initial devoicing. 
So G becomes K, B becomes P, and so on. So uh, two different data sets we did have one of those rules each, I believe. So you'll have some words, you have to explain that order. And then four, you have to determine what the morpheme is for, in, for animate objects. So there's inanimate objects as a base, and then there's animate objects um, that have some morpheme attached to them to make them uh, animate, so, so living. And I've tried my best for a data set before to actually make them sound like the real human words. So you can use the pronunciation as a hint for what the morpheme should be if you can't figure it out by taking a look at common, uh, well, common morphemes. So that is the first major assignment. This is due on June 16th by 11.59 p.m. And this will probably take a bit longer to mark than the other ones, so you might not get it back right away, and you might be doing the next minor writing assignment before you get feedback for this one, just because it's longer, and uh, not just one of us are marking it, but both of us are marking it. So you have the main marker. So it's me, if your last name is A through L. It's Magda, if your last name is K through Z. H-I-J-K-L, sorry, that's M through Z. Uh, and then you have the secondary marker. So, okay, so the main marker does what they normally do. Then you have the secondary marker. So this will be Magda and Trevor will switch. And all we're going to do here is just give a grade and then like a, a very brief comment. And what you'll get is you'll get either the average of the two scores or if there's a wide difference, um, you'll get, well, you'll get a... For most parts, you'll get an average. If the scores are really close, you might just get the higher of the two. It really depends on the writing and whether one of us are persuaded by the other's comments or not. We're both looking at them without seeing the other person's comments. So we'll get two scores for it, and then we'll discuss together why we gave those scores, and I'll make the final decision on what the grade is. Um, like, I trust... I trust Magda's evaluations just as much as I trust mine, so I'm not going to try to force her into giving lower marks for anything, and if she's not going to force me to give lower marks for anything, we'll just have a discussion. That way you can get the fairest mark possible on your major assignments. So that's it for this optional lecture. Hope it was interesting. Sorry we didn't get to do it in class, but uh, things happen. So see you on Wednesday for the standard lecture or lecture five, reading the article.